Hello and welcome to episode 11 of the Soccer 60 bro- uh, podcast brought to you by Little League. Now, Soccer 60 is a youth football podcast that we bring in coaches and those in the industries to get in to know them more and dissect more about the industry as a whole. Now, towards the end of the show, we'll be answering some of the questions from you, the listeners. So make sure you send them in via our social media platforms at Little League Soccer MY on both Facebook and Instagram. In this podcast, you'll be joined by myself, Henry Chu, Andy Johnston, and for today, Incoming FC Kuala Lumpur Technical Director, Christopher Steele. Hi Andy and Chris, how are you guys doing? Very well, thanks Henry. Doing well, thanks Henry. Alright. Now, um, usually we'll start the show with a little bit of fluffs from Henry Chu in the introduction, but today we did slightly better. Uh, We also usually start with some housekeeping from Little League, from Andy, but today is a little bit special uh, because we are bringing in Chris uh, as the new technical director of the Kuala Lumpur, I'd like to hear more about Chris's appointment from you, Andy, and a little bit more on his recruitment process. Well, sure. I'll, I'll go back a little bit further than that and just um, remind everybody that uh, our outgoing technical director, Gareth Davies, um, he was the first technical director in the post about 18 months ago now. So over the past 18 months, he's been working hard to put into place a club philosophy and a direction for the club to grow. Um, he is now leaving us to go and join Huddersfield Town back in the UK. Uh, so that sent us on um, a recruitment drive to go and find his replacement. In doing so, I ended up getting 600 applicants for the job, uh, just over 600 applicants, which was um, quite mind blowing. Uh, obviously, it was it became quite a task to shift through all those 600 applicants and um, and and figure out which direction we were going to go in. Uh, but it was it was truly mind blowing to see the the level of talent um, that that applied for the job and that were interested in the position and and therefore interested in joining the club that we've worked hard over the last few years well many years to to build up and get it to the position that it's in today. So obviously Chris sits here um, as the as the number number one that came out of that that uh, process. So uh, he's got a lot to live up to, obviously. Um, only 599 other people that wanted the job ahead of him. Uh, so I thought it would be a good way to to kind of introduce Chris to everybody. Obviously, the circumstances right now make it a little bit difficult because we don't know exactly when Chris may be able to come into the country and get started in, in his post. Um, but we're hoping it's not in the too distant future. So I thought it'd be a good idea to get him onto the podcast and and, uh, and and give him give everybody a little insight into into who he is, what he wants to achieve in uh, at, in his time at the club, um, and give uh, some of our coaches at the end of the show as well a chance to a- ask some questions of who their new boss is going to be. Uh, just just. Yep, just a little bit of a side note as well, Chris. We've got quite a number of interesting questions coming in for you at the end, so we look forward to that. Um, now, as, as the next uh, part of the show, we usually ask our guests what uh, jersey they have on, and clearly, um, Chris is a little bit too overdressed for this. However, <laughs> he does have a reason for it and also a story behind the kit. So, Chris, take it away. Yeah, so just with my career and moving around, I don't actually have any of the the football kits that I've worn growing up. Uh, They're all back in Scotland or with family in Australia. Uh, But I do actually own a kit from a Malaysian club. Uh, Back in 2015, I think it was, I got the chance to go and visit Air Asia Football Club and view one of their training sessions. And during the session, they played monkey. And I was taking part in that. And about 10 yards behind the group that I was in, there was, I think, three groups. Um, lightning struck a tree. Now, it kind of came out of nowhere. We heard some rumblings off in the distance, but there was no rain. And all of a sudden, just bang, you know, there was this thud that I felt in my chest. Some of the guys hit the deck, some of the guys just started running for cover. I essentially just froze. Um, I had never had lightning strike that close to me. Um, but after kind of seeing everyone else running, I took off under cover. Um, and, you know, when we had a look back out at the field, this tree was still smouldering. Um, now, I wish I could remember the, the name of the ground we were at, but we were inside the stadium, and I ended up just kind of leaning against the staircase that went upstairs into the stand. And I believe it was the goalkeeping coach kind of motioned over to me. And I said, you know, what's up, pal? And he said, come here. I thought, right, okay. So I walked over, and he said, look at the banister that you were leaning against. It was a metal banister. 
it was probably the worst thing that I could have been leaning against in the entire stadium. And he goes, just take care. So that's, uh, it was after that that Simon Lynn from AirAsia Football Club presented me with uh, one of their strips from that season. And I believe it's a bit of a collector's item now since the club no longer exists. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, uh, my apologies for not having that kit with me. I believe that one's back in Scotland. Uh, no, no problem for Henry. He's a wizard. He'll be able to just superimpose it on you in the video. <laughs> All you have to do is just send me the kit. I'll try my best to do that. Um, we then move on to the first segment of the show. Um, now, Chris, uh, you have had a interesting career uh, playing as well as post-playing. We'll just dive a bit more onto your playing career, Chris. Why don't you give a brief background yourself and how you got yourself into football? So it was, you know, it is the main sport in Scotland. You know, everyone that I knew played football and I just kind of fell into going to football birthday parties, kicking around in the, the school playground and ended up with uh, a team playing to youth club. We spent a couple of years there, went to different youth clubs and by the time that I was 11 years old, I think it was, I ended up going to the, the Pro Youth Academy for Clyde Football Club. And I spent a few years there and moved on to Falkirk Football Club uh, under 18. That was where I first kind of set foot into uh, training full time, you know, kind of understanding what professional football was. And, you know, from being a kid, that's all I wanted to be. You know, just, I wanted to be a footballer. And uh, I was fortunate enough to, to spend a season with those guys in the, the under 18s and reserve team. After that, I went to Australia and played with the Peen Association for a year. I was fortunate enough to win a couple of titles. Got offered a chance to go to America on a full-time scholarship um, to a, a town called Evansville. I'm sure nobody's heard of it before. Um, but that kind of taught me that I was a city boy compared to you know, going to a small town of uh, Evansville in southern Indiana. From there, it was back to Australia. I spent a bit of time playing in Asia. I was uh, 2007. I spent my time with Wu Thu Tai Po in Hong Kong. And uh, I actually played one game for Salango. Um, obviously, playing one game doesn't say that I was incredibly successful there. Uh, but I had a chance to you know, play a big, big stadium with a, a very well-renowned team. Uh, in fact, when I arrived in 2007, I was told that Salango are the Manchester United of Malaysia. So I had no pressure there. Um, after that unsuccessful stint with uh, Salango, I went back to Australia, played for a few more years. Um, Rockdale City Suns, uh, Sun Chain Coast Gen uh, Fire, and um, from there I transitioned into being a full time coach. But yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have played in a few different countries, experienced a few different styles of play, different mentalities, and I got to see some very cool parts of the world. Now, um, I, I'm quite ashamed because I am a Salago fan and I didn't even know that you were in the country for... <laughs> oh, no one does. No one does. <laughs> and did you hear something say? Yeah, I mean, um, I think there's very few people in this world that get to play professional football to any kind of level. There's e even fewer that manage to use it as a tool to travel around the world. So, Chris, like, from your experience of, of being able to use football to travel around to different parts of the world, like, what did it teach you about how, how football is treated in those different areas of, of the world and different communities? It's, it's staggering to see how it's viewed in different areas. Like, you, you grow up in Scotland and, you know, the vast majority of kids all want to play for Rangers or Celtic. And, and it's viewed as if you're good enough, you can make a legitimate career out of it from playing or coaching, even in places like Australia. When I went there, the first season that I arrived in Australia, they got rid of the old National Soccer League. So there was a year of no top tier football. Uh, everyone went to their state leagues and that was the top tier. Um, so it wasn't really a career pathway for kids in Australia. It's viewed a bit differently now. Um, but then going to places like Hong Kong, India, you know, to a certain extent Malaysia, parents don't see football as a career pathway. They see it as something their kids do that will help them, you know, get friends, stay active, stay fit and healthy. But then when they start to get into their middle to later teenage years, the focus is on academics. You know, academia plays the biggest part and football quite often, or any sport, it's kind of pushed to the background. So just seeing how football is treated by parents 
as a career pathway, that's been probably the, the biggest eye opener for me. Going into certain communities, going into certain cultures, thinking, well, football's a massive sport everywhere. Why is this treated differently? It's treated differently. Yeah, yeah this is in- interesting. We've had that discussion with a few different mm. people on this podcast, and 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 noted the challenges that it poses for us as a as a club when we deal with those kids when they get to 14, 15, 16 years old, you see lots of dropout rates and, and not even necessarily dropout rates of, of players that aren't good enough. You see dropout rates of players that are good players, um, yeah. but they, they, you know, they're forced to focus on, on their studies and, and, and whatnot. So it's definitely an interesting uh, observation from you. Mm. Now, um, Chris, out of the clubs that you've played for, um, which club now I, I, I don't know I, I think I feel like this question is a bit personal but I just want to pry it out of you but out of the clubs that you played for um, which club do you feel that um, you performed the best in and why? Oh. I need to split that into two and I'm oh. sorry if I'm changing your question but I would say the club that I felt most at home at the club that I felt as though I was most relaxed at mm-hmm. was Rockdale City Suns Mm-hmm. Rockdale in Sydney, uh, New South Wales, Australia. I still have people that I speak to today. You know, they, my teammates were truly teammates. You know, they we could rely on each other in training. They pushed each other way harder than any games. And I think that's why you know the, the 2006 season was so successful. Um, and I felt most at home there. You know, my my name when I was playing there wasn't Chris Steele. In Rockdale, I've got a Macedonian background, so. Any time that my name was announced or any time that it was written down in the club li- literature, and even you know, as, as teammates were calling me out, I became Christy Gielizzo. You know, they, they Macedonianised my name. Um, and I think that, that shows how much they kind of took me in. And you know, the, the guys in the dressing room from day one, they were brilliant. You know, I had a, a chat with uh, my old skipper, Rick, um, a, a month or two ago, just on a, a Saturday night, and, and I put it up on Instagram. And we were talking about some of the stupid things that actually made that season so well, uh, or made it so successful. Flip that to the place that I actually played the best, I believe that was with Sunshine Coast Fire um, or in Queensland, Australia. I was a few years older, I just think I was better. You know, it was a much more professional setup, and I don't mean to take any away from, from Rockdale there. I mean, it was more professional than who we had. Our head coach was a guy called George Kerry. George had played pro- uh, professional football in Scotland. He was actually my instructor on the Asian A licence, but he grew up in the West Ham United Academy. You know, when guys like Frank Lampard Sr. were there, um, Trevor Brookin, you know, when, when West Ham truly had a football factory, that's where he got his education. So it was a much more serious and focused training set. Um, you know, I was backed up with, with guys who came over from Scotland, Brian Gilfilling, who's played for a number of teams in the Scottish League. He came over for a couple of seasons. And again, it was pushing each other harder every day to get better. So most at home, Rockdale, best performances, Sunshine Coast Fire. I asked the question, I got two answers. I'm not going to say anything. I'm really happy about that one. <laughs> I think that just okay. as well just just points to how difficult it is to create uh, an atmosphere in in football clubs which um, does generate the best out of everybody in that team because you know you might you, you might focus on camaraderie and making sure that everybody is getting on well together and working hard and everyone feels at home and at place and obviously for kids football that's fun that's fantastic that's what you want uh, but doesn't necessarily as Chris has said there mean that you're going to perform to your highest level sometimes you need to yep. be a little bit out of your comfort zone and, and, and pushed in, yeah. in directions that maybe you don't feel quite as comfortable so I think it, it, it's an interesting uh, observation mm. um, care to share, share with us Chris a uh, fond memory of yours while you were still playing um so this is going back to my first game, uh, first game with uh, Rockdale City Suns, mm-hmm. and during pre-season, um, I was you know quite comfortable. I'd played senior football before, but again, it's making that debut for a new team, new league. Didn't know, didn't know the league, didn't know the guys too well. We had spent pre-season together, but still getting to know how they play. And for whatever reason, I hadn't cut my hair during pre-season. Okay. <laughs> 
my sound burns don't generally go down the way, they just get bigger going out the way. <laughs> so for that first game, the two centre halves that would have been front and centre, one was Rick the skipper, the other one is still an incredibly good friend, Alex Kotovic. Both of them were out for the first game of the season and we were playing our local derby. Now when I say local derby from Rockdale's ground, you can see St George's Stadium. I mean, it's with an eye shot, so it is a very passionate local derby. And it was myself and I think I was 21 at the time. And my centre-half partner that night was 20. So it was a very young centre-half partnership. And one of the senior boys, uh, Joey Moric, Joey said, look, your hair's ridiculous. You know, come here and I'll give you a trim. You know, he, he took my sideburns from there, like, up to there. <laughs> 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 Very hard one. You know, I couldn't leave them like that. So, Joey then took the scissors to the other side. And I spent, like, the first ten minutes of the game worrying about my hair. <laughs> but, but that was great because then I just played. Yeah, I, all my all my nervous energy about playing, you know, getting into a good rhythm, you know, beating the game, that just all disappeared. Um, and I, as much as Joey... As a character, you know, Muzz was brilliant. I think that was deliberate stupidity on his behalf, or deliberate, you know, hysteria. And you know, he he knew what I needed, and he gave it to me. So that that's one that stands out, uh, just as as a good teammate being a bad teammate because he needed to be. <laughs> I think I think Chris is immediately going to bond with some kids in our club because I have definitely seen kids playing in matches that are more worried about their hair than what they're yeah. doing on the pitch. <laughs> yeah. So we have definitely got that sorted, for sure. That is definitely for sure. I'm very sure at that time, that would have been fixed before they were about Vaseline, right, Chris? Say that again, sorry? I, I think it would have been fixed before they were about Vaseline. But there was no hair. He took it up so high. It was gone. <laughs> like, there was nothing to vacillate there. It wasn't as always flapping about. There was just none. He took it all the way. So, yeah, it took a couple of weeks for it to grow back in. But um, I thought it was a decent uh, debut performance for the club. And uh, yeah, big thanks to, to Moz for that. <laughs> um, now, I, I know Andy asked earlier about uh, what you've learned from uh, your playing career, playing abroad as a journeyman. But... Uh, now, uh, if you had one takeaway from your career as a player, being a journeyman, what would it be? What would it be? What have you brought uh, today? To to today? today, I was not. I was not a very good player. I was average. I could read the game well, but in terms of overall capability, I wasn't great. I was average, um, and I, I say quite openly that if I was a good player, I wouldn't have had to left Scotland. I would have been playing at a higher level in Scotland. But the reason that I made a living from football, the reason I'm still in football now, is I just want to be the hardest worker in the room. Yeah, you know, I, I I won't stop until I get to where I want to go. And from being a kid wanting to be a footballer, I got there. You know, Andy, you said that very few people actually make it to where you know they go and play a game that they love and they get cash back in return for it. That's a pretty good deal to me. Yeah. Um, and that all came about because I worked hard. You know, I wasn't naturally talented on the ball. You know, I could not glide past players like Ronaldinho or Messi. You know, I was not Ali McCoist, my my hero growing up. I couldn't bang in goals like he did, um, but I could see things happening. I could read the game okay, and I worked hard. That's it. And if you want to get where you want to go, just make sure you work harder than anyone else. I, I, I think you know I go uh, like Chris has uh, just referenced there about um, not many people being able to make a, a living from football mm -hmm. and obviously everybody sees becoming a professional footballer is a success if you go on and sign a big contract and make millions of dollars and 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 you don't have to worry about you know working again after that that's seen as kind of the goal of becoming a professional footballer but right. there's an awful lot of footballers around the world that are playing professionally that will have to work after they've finished their their playing career so and i think that that chris has used it in a very interesting way there it's been a, a way for him to get um paid whilst traveling the world whilst playing yep. the game that he loves uh and obviously that has provided um a lot of experiences for him which he now can draw on in his professional career after playing mm. and i think that's a great example to to some kids who maybe they maybe they it's not achievable to get to that top level but you still want to play um the game that you love you still want to be rewarded for it uh and it's possible it just goes to show that it is possible and it can take you all the way around the world and uh mm -hmm. you know maybe you have to be a little bit creative i'm sure 
when Chris left Scotland to go and play football in Australia, it was probably a decision that was met with a, a lot of questions from people close to him, I would imagine. Um, mm. And I, I, you know, I would imagine that's quite a, a difficult thing to do when you're when you're a very young uh, young man. But it just, you know, it, it goes to show the options that are out there if you if you desire to to do that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, that that closes the segment quite well. Now we move on. One, to last, wait, wait, oh, one oh. last question on on Chris's career. Okay, uh, okay. Being a Scotsman, I'm quite interested. Uh, <laughs> more red cards or more goals in your career? Zero red cards. Wow. Zero goals. Zero. I I got booked more than anyone I know from descent. <laughs> I am happy. I am happy to tell a referee when they are wrong, how they are wrong, and how often they are wrong. Um, so I never got red carded. Um, I think if we're talking about goals, I managed two. Uh, so more goals than red cards. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Um, that that let's let's then move on to the next segment, which is your post playing career, Chris. Um, now, when I was doing um, my background research on this podcast. Uh, so a lot of positions came into mind uh, in my head, stuck in my head right now, which is head assistant, um, head assistant, goalkeeper coach, assistant manager, academy director, scout, game analyst, consultant. Now, is there any reasoning behind the diversity in your job selection post-playing career? Yeah, I, I, I fully believe that to be the most effective manager that I can be. You know, I, I ultimately want to be a head coach um, mm. at a relatively big club. You know, I'm setting my sights high and if I don't get there, well, hopefully I'll have his interest in a career going on as I have up to this point. But for me to fully understand what someone else's job entails, the highs, the lows in between, well, have I spent time doing it? So if an analyst or a scout comes to me and says, I can't do X, whatever X is, now, someone who hasn't been in their shoes might say, well, you know, just go figure it out. But sometimes you can't. Sometimes you, you don't have the resource, you don't have the time, you don't have the capability. And if I can empathise with someone, if I can understand the, the pitfalls of their job, hopefully I'll be able to help them better do that job. So trying to be as rounded as possible is definitely a part of my career plan. Hmm. Jack of all trades, I have to say. Um, no, no, we. Was... <laughs> I didn't want to say that, <laughs> but it's better to be best at one. So you know what I mean. It's better to diversify um, whatever you do in terms of when you learn something and when you do your work. That helps a lot. Um, we also take a look at how travelled you are in your coaching career. Um, now, of course, uh, we you you would have also done something where you said, right, I'm done with my playing career, I've travelled enough as a player, I can now go back to Scotland and just continue my job there and I do everything there. But you've decided to then continue working abroad. What made you take that leap of faith? Uh, in 2008, it was almost um, an enforced choice. You know, I, had, uh, I had torn the meniscus in my right knee, went for an operation, um, but I ended terms badly with Sunshine Coast Fire. Um, I was doing a, a skills programme with them. They didn't pay me for six weeks. Um, and I, I started chasing the club for payment. And you know, you're talking about professional players, you automatically think of the big teams and the big leagues. And most professional players aren't there. And Andy, as you said, you, know, you have to have something to keep you going afterwards. You can't just retire at the age of 85, 86, 87. Um, and it's a lot of the time it's through people getting forced to chase up clubs for money, which unfortunately I know has been an issue with Malaysian clubs in the past. Um, but this club in the Sunshine Coast of Queensland, I'd been doing schools programmes in the off-season for them. I hadn't been paid in six weeks and I had agreed to a new, to a new contract for next year. I had just bought a house in the area and I had just signed on to be the, the franchisee for Sunshine Coast, or Curver Sunshine Coast. I'm sure you're familiar with Curver Coaching. Mm. And not being paid, I went after the club and they tore up my contract for the following season. So I kind of had to double down on the coaching. I had just become a franchisee, which I had royalties and payments due. I always had a mortgage on the house, which obviously has payments. And I had to take that step to keep going. Um, 
so I doubled down on the coaching, did as much coach education as I could, I did stuff with clubs, I did stuff with schools, I did some uh, things with individuals, and yeah, it was a, an enforced change from playing to coaching. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but that doesn't matter because I, I feel like now that you've you've, you've looked past that, uh, you're looking at what you've achieved now. I think that that was a uh, I guess I guess to a certain extent it was that it happened for a reason, right? Um, yeah, it, it happened for a reason. It's, it's something that you know it's it's not the the way that I wanted to step out of professional football, mm-hmm. but it's just a challenge. And if mm-hmm. you let these things knock you down, well, you're never going to get to where you want to go. So, you know, it, it ended up being a great opportunity. You mentioned about me going elsewhere, yep. going from Curver Sunshine Coast. I then got the opportunity to go and become um, the head of Curver Coaching in India from a, a technical capacity. So that was that was a great experience. And again, one wouldn't have happened if the other didn't. So, yeah. With the punches, I guess. With that being quite a quick transition from playing to coaching career, what what was the biggest adjustments you had to make in in how you ran your life? Um, it was knowing that I was responsible for making my money. You know, I if I turned up to training, if I turned up to games, the club would pay me. That that's how it was as a professional footballer. But I couldn't just turn up to somewhere and expect kids to be there. You know, I had to become everything that you'd have in a company from CEO to janitor and everything in between. That was now me. So going from just having one job and doing that one job to the best of your ability, I then had to be everything. Um, and that was probably the biggest, you know, having to have a focus like that to being as wide eyed as possible mm. to try and see every part from, you know, what programs that I put on the field. Where do I actually do them? Who do I target for it? Um, what age groups I mean by that? Or what level do I target to try and put my services towards? Um, yeah, going from having a very narrow focus to having a very wide focus um, or a very wide view of, of how to run a company, how to run a coaching business, that was the biggest challenge. Mm. Now, uh, in all of these uh, experiences that you've had, out of the four continents that you applied your trade in, which one did you enjoy working in the most? Which country and why? Um, I'll say, I'll say Asia is the the continent that I've enjoyed most, mm. um, and I'm going to use not geographical Asia but AFC's terminology of Asia, because I've enjoyed coaching in continental Asia. But as I said before, my playing career wrapped mm-hmm. in Australia, so Australia is part of AFC. Asia, easy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there we go uh, I, I like how you brought that up as well Because the next question would be that You not only have a UEFA license But you also have an AFC license as well Now, what made you decide to do both Instead of holding on to one that seemed to have a higher stature? Really simply, Kelly Cross Kelly Cross is a FIFA instructor He's an AFC instructor I'm fortunate enough to have two guys that I would classify as mentors in my career. Um, one is Kelly, who was my instructor on the Asian A license, the first part of it. And the other is Donald Park, who took me through a number of UEFA licenses. Um, but I had a bit of a break between part one of my Asian A license and part two. I went to India to, to work there. And when I came back, I had a, a quite blunt conversation with Kelly and said, for the cost of my second part of my AFCA license, I can do my old UEFA B license and get two sets of return flights to Scotland. Mm. What should I do? And Kelly said, ultimately, where do you want to work? And I said, Europe. I would love to go back and work as a head coach in Europe. And he said, okay, you get your Asian A license, you can work anywhere in Asia. You get your UEFA A license, you can work anywhere. That was it. So, absolutely, Kelly Cross. I need to thank Big Time for that. Um, and it was after I've got my ASCB license. I did part one, as I said, and then I went back to do my UEFA B license, mm-hmm. A license, and UEFA license subsequently. And I took the step rather than going from Asian B license to UEFA A license, which I was eligible to do. I went to do my UEFA B license. 
purely because I felt as though the year that I spent working in India, I hadn't been working at a high enough level to step into the UEFA license. Mm. I didn't know that system or, or that uh, advanced qualifications of it all. I didn't know the advanced setup well enough just through talking with people and seeing things online. So I wanted to have first hand experience of going through their system. And that's why, thankfully, now that I've, I've got both sets of criteria or qualifications, sorry. Mm. Now, um, before we move on to the next segment as well. Uh, I'm keen to know more about your career in game analysis a bit more because you are one of the first few guests that we've actually had have that in their resume. Um, apart from what you've said about how you'd like, you'd like to have a broader view on a career in post-playing, um, what was it about game analysis that made you pursue, pursue your career in it? Uh, I get it. goes back to the qualifications. Mm. I was looking at the UEFA B set up what they were looking for, uh, UEFA AVE license and youth license, and there was a big component of it that was game analysis. And I had never done any of that before. Mm. So I approached someone that I knew at Western Sydney Wanderers in Australia. He was the head coach of the, the W League team. And I said, look, for my next qualification, I need to do this for, for the upcoming season. I'll do it for free. Can I do your game analysis? just to give myself experience. Mm. Thankfully, at that time, I was able to coach to make up a living, um, and, and I could do the analysis on the side. And that uh, it was purely to make sure that when I went into the UEFA B license, I wasn't behind everyone else. I, uh, I didn't want to be the guy who's you know setting the stand up here, and everyone else is up here. Mm. That was it. So okay. two seasons. Uh, first season, it was very much just the game analysis. For the second season, uh, as I was going through my coaching and I kind of proved myself as a, a coach, uh, I put forward some tactical things that I saw. I put forward some training exercises that I saw and uh, the coach incorporated those into the training sessions. That's brilliant. Um, now, we all know that this is not your first time in Malaysia. Uh, what is it about the country that is making you come back? Uh, I've met some great people there. The, every time that I've come to the country, and I think I'm on you know, number 11 now, I've felt more and more comfortable. Uh, I left Hong Kong to come to Malaysia because an agent that my agent here in Hong Kong said there might be a chance with a Malaysian club. I found that out at 10 p.m. one night, and I was on a plane at 11 a.m. the next day. Going to wow. Malaysia, and... When I arrived in KL, I, I just felt comfortable. Um, the place that I was put up wasn't the nicest. Um, it was in Chow Kit. Um, but it, it, I kind of got to know not the Surya KLCC side of Kuala Lumpur. I got to know a little bit more gritty side of it. Um, and there's a place that is still, um, I think it's on Jalan Tun Razak. There's a place called Mungo Jerry's. Um, and Chowka. And it's great food. It is absolutely yep. brilliant. Um, yep. And that, that, I mean, I, I love cooking, I love eating. And as much as feeling incredibly comfortable in Malaysia, I love the diversity of food. You know, you, you guys have got, you know, traditional Malaysian dishes. You've got things that have been inspired by Chinese, Indian, Filipino, you know, European dishes. It's, it's just a brilliant culinary experience for me. That's the one thing. That's the one pulling factor that Malaysia has. And we're gonna, still food. We're going to be and, responsible for yet another coach's weight gain. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm not well, mentioning any names to any of our coaches that are listening to this. I'm pretty sure they'll mention it back to you, uh, without a doubt. <laughs> Um, now, now that now that we've talked about a little bit about Malaysia and you coming over, we go on to the topic of the episode where we get to know more about Chris Steele, the FC Kuala Lumpur technical director. Now, Chris, this is not your first time as a academy director or technical director per se, but what is it about FCKL that made you decide that yes, this is going to be the place for me? Two things, two two big things stood out. One, as I had mentioned, you know my affinity for. Malaysia for KL, um, mm -hmm. it drew me to it straight away. And the, the second part of it was being able to coach and influence a program going forward. 
uh, my last academy director's position, I was told I wasn't allowed to coach a team. You know, I, I oversaw the coaches, I helped their development, I drew up session plans, but I didn't have that daily, weekly or, or game-to-game -game interaction with a team. Part of the job description is to coach a team and that really drew me to, to the position. Being able to, to expand upon the program that's already in place is another big benefit. Mm -hmm. when, during my travels, I've seen a number of places where if you say, okay, we're going to start a club, you're starting from day one, from ground level. There's nothing in place. I think if you look at FCKL and you know, Little League as a whole, you've got 20 odd years of experience there. A lot of the heavy lifting has already been done by guys like Andy or Gareth or the coaches that are still in place will have knowledge from what the, the issues were two, four, six years ago and they'll be able to catch me up to speed, hopefully, you know, in a, a relatively quick space of time. And as an outsider who's been able to draw influences from all over the place, hopefully I might be able to see some things that have been missed. And that's not to say that the coaches wouldn't see it if they went elsewhere, but sometimes it's the, you know, you can't see the forest for the trees thing, you know, you get a little bit too close. Mm. So hopefully I can come in and, and my first job will be to observe. Mm. What what do I see from the programme, what do I see from the players, the coaches, the parents and then I'll be able to give my feedback and hopefully influence in a positive manner a well established programme moving forward and getting even better. Mm. Mm. I like this. I'd like to just uh, quickly go back to something we, we talked about in the last segment and Chris you were mentioning about uh, having two great mentors in your coaching career and I think that um, you know one of the reasons why we looked uh, outside uh, when we were when we were looking to replace Gareth as, as technical director was we were looking for somebody to come in like you said with a fresh uh, set of eyes someone that's got experience of working with with big clubs and, and around the world and, and coming to lend their kind of expertise to the program Obviously, you're coming into a program where we've got a lot of uh, really good qualified coaches, but you're going to be the, the only A license and you're the A license uh, youth elite UEFA mm -hmm. coach. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of our coaches that will look up to that and, and will look to you for the direction um, that, that is needed going forward. How do you anticipate uh, taking on the role of potentially a mentor for, for some of our younger coaches, especially? Mm -hmm. and that's a great question. Um, I, I hope that I can be to anyone who, who wants me to be, I can be the Donald Park or the Kelly Cross to them. And the one thing, if anyone who's ever done a session with Parky um, on any of the UEFA licenses, you come off from your session and he'll say, well, how do you think it went? And it's an immediate self-reflection. And, you know, I, I will always try and hold the mirror up to myself and say, was I good enough? And that's one thing that I would try and put across to coaches. When you become a head coach or when you become a TD or a director or coach, whatever the title might be, ultimately you're responsible to you for how good or bad a program is. If you're happy with it, at least you can sleep easy. It doesn't mean everyone's going to be happy with it. It doesn't mean everyone's going to be happy with your decisions. But how do you think it went? Self-evaluation for me is huge. And looking at these two guys, they always put things back onto you. I'm not saying that they shirk responsibility and guidance, absolutely not. They were brilliant in guiding you to answers. Sometimes it was the answers that they wanted, hmm. that they wanted you to give. Sometimes it was things that you hadn't thought about, but they kept on poking and prodding and asking why. And those questions of why is something, I believe it's the best question in the world. Why? And if it's an open and honest why, sometimes it gets you to answers that you didn't think would appear. Yeah. Um, I'm not always, sometimes I will tell coaches, this is what I want, but I'll always have a why. Other times it'll be, well, why did you do that? Is there another way you could have done that? What if? Um, so yeah, I hope that these two guys, both of them are pro license holders, both of them are on technical study groups, both of them are very approachable. Um, that's the kind of mentor, if I ever do become a mentor, that I would love to be. And it's purely based on Donald Park and Kelly Cross. I cannot praise these guys highly enough. 
And uh, obviously, one of the things that we put in the job description and we spoke about extensively in the in the interview process as well was about um, coaching development and what you might be able to bring to the table in, in helping our our coaches develop their own skill sets and and developing yep. that that kind of quality of coaching and consistency of coaching as well throughout the program. Can you give the the coaches especially and and perhaps some of the parents that are listening to this as well a little bit of insight as to what you kind of plan to do in that respect? Uh, to sum up in one sentence, get comfortable being uncomfortable. So I, I know that some coaches will love four four two, some will love three five five two, but I'm going to ask at times: don't play your favoured formation. Don't play your right winger just in right winger because you think he's a right winger. Can we look at just putting you outside of your comfort zone in terms of it might be the age group that you're comfortable working with? And I'm hoping that that will be able to expand people's communication skills. If you're used to working with under 18s, you might be able to say things in a certain way that you cannot say to a six, seven, eight year old. You need to change how you speak to them and what you say to them. I think that was the the biggest difference that I saw from the, the senior UFA license to the youth A license. And the youth A license is much more intense and it's a lot more difficult. And I believe that. The way that they want you to communicate is you need to give the kids more information, but don't overload them and make it more simple. So finding that balance of being able to give them just the right information that they can understand it was very different to the senior day license, where a lot of the stuff was chess pieces. You move here, you move here, you move here. And when you move to those positions. Um, so yeah, hopefully by my time, however long it is at the club, coaches, players, parents uh, will be comfortable being uncomfortable. I think as well, you, you, you touched on a really interesting subject there. You know, um, we had a lot of applicants that came with a with an A license, either from UEFA or AFC or, or uh, wherever it may have been. But but few, much less of them had the youth elite um, badge. Uh, and I think it's interesting to hear there your, your, your differences and, and what you learn um, on those particular courses and how they differ? Because I think there's not so many people that are aware of those two different programs existing. So it's quite interesting yeah. to hear about that. Yeah, I think the, the only ones that I know, and I'm, I'm happy to be corrected on this one, um, but from the home nations, you've got Scotland, Wales, and I believe, um, well, sorry, the Republic of Ireland have got those courses. Um, and it is the difference between the SFA, A license and youth A, is the senior A license, you go in during the summer, you do your time in the introduction, you do a couple of weekends for tutorial weekends, and then you go back the following summer to do your assessment. For the youth A license, I believe it starts in February and finishes in November, and you are in every month apart from July. And you're in every month for three or four days, and the instructors are on you. You know, you've got, throughout the course, I think you've got 12 assessments mini assessments, big assessments, you've got 16 assignments uh, and you're seeing guys improve every month. You don't want to be left behind and, and because someone like Donald Park, I, I view him as you know, the best coach educator I've ever come across in my travels, you don't want to let these guys down. You don't want to let them come back to you and say, so over the last month you've done nothing. You want to keep up with your peers, you want to impress the, the coaches. And it's so intense because you're there every month, apart from the, the summer month off. Um, sorry, in Scotland it's probably a summer weekend, but you're there so often and it's so intense, it's so difficult. But flip that around, it's so rewarding when you get out the other end of it. Now, um, we just go back a little bit into the FC Colombo philosophy. Now, we've had um, Coach Gareth um, set, his, set a philosophy for the club. Now, are you looking to revamp the structure or are you looking to follow up with the foundation that's been set? As I said before, my first task will be observation. Mm. You know, I, I'm not going to come in with sweeping changes. Mm. You know, I, I might say, right, I'm going to change this, I'm going to change it to whatever it might be. And someone say, well, we've already got that. Mm -hmm. You know, or we've already tried that and it didn't work and here's why it didn't work. So it's absolutely going to be trying to build on the, the solid foundation that you know, the, the admin staff have put in place, that the coaches have put in place, that the players have put in place. And, you know, it's the club has been around for a while now. It's 2009 that it was established. 
Yep. You don't get to have over ten years of of success if you're doing things badly. So it's got to be more evolution than revolution. And you know, one thing that I tell the teams or the players that, that work under me, I'm gonna ask for better. And when mm. you give me better, I'm gonna ask for better. And when you give me better again, I'm gonna ask for better again. So it, it has to be that constant development, that constant improvement and evolution. So it's not going to be reform. It's not going to be revolution. Um, you know, I, I hope that as much as I'm going to be coming in and, and hopefully teaching coaches and players some things, they'll be able to teach me as well. Right. I think this goes back as well to the to the recruitment process that we were talking about before. You know, obviously football's a, a hugely... Um, uh, philosophical subject and every every coach has their own opinions and beliefs as to what, what they should do and what they shouldn't do, how they should play, how they shouldn't play uh, and that was part of my task really in, in speaking or, or whittling out from 600 people who was going to be a good fit for this role is that we want to we don't want somebody to come in and completely change the philosophy that we've been working on for the last 18 months um, but we do want someone that comes in with, with kind of similar ideas and then takes that and pushes it forward and I think that that's that's what I think we found in in Chris uh, and what we look forward to for the future and we, we don't want to see wholesale changes overnight because course, we've been working course. hard at, at trying to achieve something for the last uh, couple of years now Chris uh, I know this is kind of a long shot for me to ask this question but I still want to ask you anyway um, do you have a five-year plan already set for FC Kuala Lumpur no no, no, well, no I don't have a five-year plan he's got a four-year um, and eight-month plan <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple of reasons for that is one I, looking back to what I said in the, the last question mm -hmm. there's no point in me planning for things if I don't know the ins and outs of operations right. again it could be something that I suggest well we already have that in place it could be better than what I suggest so there's no point in me taking it a step down if you guys have already improved upon what I suggested um, and also you know I, I'm looking at the first 90 days you know, what can what can I go and see and suggest to make improvements on? And then we're looking at 12 months and then 24 months. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it would be somewhat presumptuous of me to say, you know, from a two-year contract, I've already got a three-year extension. <laughs> So I like I like the humble response to that one. I think the, no. the, the timing is just an important thing to, to talk about there as well because Chris obviously mm -hmm. has, has mentioned the first sort of 90 days and we're, we're very much hoping to have him in the country and in the role uh, early October. We'll yep, yep. see what happens with, with COVID and regulations, whether that's possible or not, but we're very much hoping that that's the kind of time frame. And if, this achieve, if that's achieved, then you, know, you look for 90 days takes you to the end of the year and then January 1st is you know, the new season. So that, mm -hmm. that kind of fits in. That's, that's the whole point of why we try to uh, get this re recruitment process done relatively quickly and yep, so yep. that we can move forward and, um, and, and move on and, and let uh, the new coach come in to have a little bit of time to uh, assess, as Chris has spoken about a lot there, um, and then start to put some plans in for the next uh, year. It kind of works timing-wise. Yep, yep. Let's hope that works out. <laughs> fingers crossed, Andy, fingers crossed. Um, now, of course, I wanted to ask this question to um, Chris, but he seems to have answered. He seemed to have answered it already. So I'm going to. Throw what's the point of answering it? So, so I'm going to throw the question to you, Andy. What do you look forward to the most for Chris? Uh, uh, when Chris comes in as the incoming technical director of FCKL, uh, I look forward. I think we've already mentioned it, but uh, a fresh pair of eyes. Uh, you know, like it's. It doesn't matter. I don't think how good an organization is and how well it's running. Uh, you can always benefit, I think, from an experienced pair of eyes coming from the outside. You know, there's going to be all sorts of things that Chris has seen uh, throughout his career, which we will not have noticed happening in the club. So to have someone come in with a fresh set of uh, eyes and have their own, own kind of ideas and uh, observe what we're doing. And then um, I'm looking forward to the feedback of what he thinks we're doing well, what areas he thinks we can improve on. Um, and ultimately, I'm just looking forward to, to growth over the next uh, 12 to 24 months um, mm -hmm. and just seeing how well we can actually do in, in replicating some of the top uh, youth clubs around the world because that's that's our goal you know we want to be yes, providing yes. the best quality platform for young footballers to to develop um, to the best of their ability 
uh, and we're just trying to do as good a job as we can at that. Obviously, Chris has tremendous experience. Uh, he has the highest coaching credentials in terms of badges and qualifications we could we can we can expect. Um, mm -hmm. So I look forward to see how that gets implemented into our club and, and what changes we see in the future. That is, I, will also, I, think I, I will also say I'm also excited on behalf of the coaches as well because you know I think that they, they've got somebody coming in here who, who like I said has got has been been through the highest level coaching badges has got good experience um, at, at many different places around the world and I think it's going to be a really good opportunity for some of our coaches to to, to pick his brains and and yep, try to yep. learn some things as well and develop their own coaching career. Mm. Um, Chris, are you a Bookworm? Would you consider yourself a bookworm? No, no, I wouldn't consider myself a bookworm um, purely mm. because it, it's not a huge number of books. Saying that, I've actually got one within reach of me right now from Twenty First <laughs> Club. Um, but um, I'm, I'm online a lot, and mm -hmm. I'll read anything. I'll read anything and everything, but mm -hmm. I, I don't often sit down with an actual book. No. Okay, I've got someone in the company and uh, uh, a good colleague of mine to help you out with the books uh, when you come over. And you should know who he is. <laughs> uh, the, guy, the guy reads enough books for everybody in the company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that is for sure. I'm pretty sure he has collected enough books for all of, uh, amongst all of us. Now, we move on to the final segment of the show uh, where I like to take questions and ask Andy and Chris. Uh, Andy and Chris has no idea what these questions are about but this is a little bit of a special edition this is going to be a little bit of an icebreaker for the coaches as well um, this is going to be coming from the coaches Chris so yep. first question of Ask Soccer 60 would be from Simon Wartica uh, Simon asks you have worked in a few different countries what would you say is one of the biggest things you have learned from working in football abroad apart from what you have just mentioned <laughs> at, the, at the start of the podcast understand the culture Mm -hmm. know what you're stepping into and if you don't know what you're stepping into take a bit of time to to get to know it um, I think there's there's a lot of coaches who have been unsuccessful and I'm from personal experience I'm looking back at my time in India where I went in and quite often I was talking to people who were older than me who were less qualified than me and of a different race and I'm telling them what to do and they just went no Mm. So if I can understand the culture first, if I can get to relate whatever I'm trying to relate to them from whether it is a religious, whether it is a racial, whether it is just a national perspective, it will help me a lot more. And I, I do, I love languages um, and I am absolutely intent on trying to learn Bahasa uh, when I get there. Um, right now, um, I, I can quite angrily say, can I buy? <laughs> but you know, I, I want to try and get a, a hold of the language so that I can understand the culture even better than I do. Mm, that's really interesting. Um, next question would be from Shazwan Wong. Uh, biggest challenge that you have encountered in youth football? Biggest challenge is different expectations. My expectations going into a role. Um, and the expectations predominantly of parents. Mm -hmm. Parents are quite often the largest obstacle that youth coaches have to overcome. And sometimes it'll be a parent who, as we mentioned earlier, you know, this is just a hobby. This is a pastime for my kid that they'll, they'll play once or twice during the week and again at the weekend. If the mindset of the club or the academy is not that, you're gonna have problems flip that to the other side where you've got the parent who knows that his kid is the next Ronaldo or Messi. No matter what the kid's level is, I know that my kid's going to play professional. Why is he not playing up? Why is he not starting every game? Why is he not playing every minute? Mm. So being able to, again, link my last answer, understanding the culture of the country, the players, the parents, the club, and being able to understand the parent group um, from a expectation level, uh, yeah, that's that's a delicate one. I'll say that. Mm. Um, okay, just a little bit more lighthearted one for you for you now. Uh, Mark Hughes asks: Football has taken you around the world, and you have had a wealth experience, a wealth of experience and knowledge. So, where have you had the best fish supper? Glasgow. 
The Blue Lagoon. Blue Lagoon in Glasgow, absolutely magic. <laughs> It says I'm, I'm gonna I'm hopefully I have a chance to go to Scotland, definitely that that's something that I would try. I think if I were to say uh if I were to answer Mark as well uh I I I'm very vanilla at this but I think the best fish supper I have had was with Liverpool surprisingly. Well, <laughs> I think if you like as I said I I absolutely adore the the the, uh, the, the cuisine in Malaysia. But if you are looking for fried food, you cannot go past Scotland. <laughs> I'll take your word for that. Um, final question from all of us, and this comes from uh, Rashidan Malik. Um, what is the difference that you've seen between Asian grassroots and European grassroots, grassroots in terms of football development? And what is your advice for the young coaches to succeed? The difference is the infrastructure. You know, European football has had, you know, decades, uh, when it's centuries of clubs being well organised, well run, self-sufficient to an extent. You know, I love the fact that Malaysian clubs are now being forced to privatise. Mm -hmm. you're, you're seeing clubs move away from a state-funded uh, organisation and they're going to have to look at how do we make ourselves sustainable. Uh, being able to move away and this is purely from a professional football stance you know and i do believe that recreational football recreational players have a place in the game you know as a whole ecology of it but being able to take things to the next level forcing clubs to look after themselves is huge you know if, if an academy if a private academy isn't successful can't pay its own bills it disappears quickly unfortunately this is fortunately it's changing Clubs in Malaysia didn't have to be good, didn't have to be self-sufficient to get funding for next year. So I think that will ultimately have a trickle-down effect. Um, if you look at Selangor 2 mm. for, for this season, I believe over the last two games, their average age has been just over 19 years old. Mm -hmm. They've had no foreigners start in the last two games. So their German TD who came in, I believe, at the end of last year, He's forcing them to look down. You know, he's forcing them to look at younger age groups and develop uh, going down the way rather than just saying all our efforts are going into the first team. That's the biggest difference between Asia and Europe in a general sense. You know, if you look at clubs in uh, in Japan, for example, they seem to be a lot more organised across all ages, across infrastructure, admin, coaching. Um, but even when I had my recent trip to Asia, Cambodia. Cambodian players really surprised me. Mm. I would describe them as street footballers. You know, they, they're happy getting the ball and taking on two, three, four players. You know, they, they're really comfortable on the ball. But they're the, one of the games that I went to, in fact, my first day in the country, I went to watch Bonquet play against Sparring. Bonquet Stadium is an active, or was, an active building site. And this is a team in the top league. And just before kickoff, the guys are packing up the wheelbarrows you know, to say, okay, now you can come in. So in terms of just infrastructure, that's the biggest difference. And that infrastructure isn't just physical assets. It's not the stadia or the training grounds. It then goes into coach education. Mm. So if one, I, I'm sure other coaches do it, but if I'm flying into or out of anywhere, I always look for football grounds. Can I see any of the, the city stadium? Can I see football pitches? I remember very vividly flying into Amsterdam and I didn't see one single football pitch. They were always in packs, you know, they were in twos or fours or sixes. That's something we don't have in Scotland. You know, mm. there's a lot of individual pitches. And I think if you can start creating little clubs that have got great facilities, the wealth of talent will be wider spread. Mm -hmm. And hopefully if you've got, rather than one team that's got six, eight or 10 really good players in an age group, you'll have two, three or four clubs in an area that'll have two, 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 two uh, players that are really good and they'll enjoy playing against each other and it'll just become a fertile land for developing players, developing coaches um, and developing the, the infrastructure around the actual game. Mm. That's, that's, my, that's my long term, that's my five-year plan for Asian football. There you go. 
<laughs> that we got answer as well from the previous uh, from the previous segment. Now, uh, one more the, the the final question, the final part of the question was, what advice would you give to the young coaches, Chris? Get on the pitch, get on the pitch as much as you can, and make mistakes. Um, I'm I'm sure that when I got my first coaching qualification at 16 years old, uh, the it was a grassroots, it's called Early Touches, or it was called Early Touches in Scotland. Mm. I was 16 years old, had the level 1.1 coaching qualification, and at that point I was the best coach in the world. <laughs> that That's the, the mistake that I made. You know, and, and as you gain qualifications, as you see good coaches, like really good coaches, um, guys who have had proper experience. I mean, we've, we've spoken a bit about where I played and where I coached, but one of my best friends in football now is Raddy Jaidi. Raddy played for Bolton, Birmingham and Southampton. He went to two World Cups. He went to two African Cup of Nations, winning one of them. He captained Tunisia. He's their highest caps, uh, capped player of all time. I've learned a huge amount from Raddy. You know, and, and that's a guy who has played and coached at a, a level above me. But that 16-year-old me, I would have disregarded him. So get on the pitch as much as you can, make as many mistakes as you can, but make sure you hold that mirror up to yourself. Make sure after every session you go back and think, what could I have done better? So that that would be my my advice, not just for young coaches, but for any coach. Well, and that is a very good way to end episode 11 of Soccer 60. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining us today, and we are really looking forward to seeing you soon. Excellent, thank you. Uh, now, don't forget to give us your feedback. Send us some questions. We'd love to hear from you guys. Subscribe to us on your favorite podcasting platforms and don't forget to rate us. Now, if you rate us five stars, please tell us that you've enjoyed it. And if you don't rate us five stars, you can also let us know in the comments of your favorite podcasting platforms on what we can improve on. Um, most importantly, do not forget to follow Little League Soccer Malaysia on their social media platforms, which is at Little League Soccer MY on both Facebook and Instagram. This has been episode... Uh, 11 of Soccer 60 until next time see you guys in the next episode